This is a podcast by The Straits Times. Welcome to Singapore's War on COVID, a podcast series by The Straits Times. This podcast series is based on selected chapters from a book detailing Singapore's experience battling the COVID-19 pandemic. The book, written by journalists of The Straits Times and edited by ST's executive editor Sumiko Tan, is titled In This Together, Singapore's COVID-19 Story and is available in major bookstores now. Details online at stbooks.sg Hello, I'm Timothy Goh, a health correspondent at The Straits Times, and I'll be reading you a condensed version of The Hunt for Masks that I wrote for Chapter 2 of the book. Episode 2, The Global Hunt for Masks This is a story of how Singapore quietly and quickly dispatched individuals and teams overseas from late January 2020 to procure masks and other essential items such as thermometers, and how Singapore managed to bring home full-scale mask production capabilities on the quiet. Just 12 hours earlier, Mr. Jayakumar Manikam had been at his desk in his office in Pioneer Road doing what he always did, analysing data, and managing logistics operations. Now, it was three in the morning. He was in a factory in India's high-tech city of Bengaluru, on a critical mission with Singapore's future at stake. He had crucial documents inside his hastily packed backpack. His mission? To secure a large shipment of surgical face masks for the Singapore government. Mr. Jayakuma, who was then Senior Operations Manager at ST Logistics, said, It was January 20th, 2020. I was in my operation center and at 3 p.m. I was called for an urgent brief and told to fly off at 8 p.m. that same night. Without a second thought, I said, okay, I'll do it because it's for the country. He had just three hours to head home, throw some clothes into a bag, rush to the airport. All he could tell his wife and daughters was that he had to leave for an important assignment. They thought I was joking. The 56-year-old, had not flown overseas for work in 27 years. Mr. Jayakuma was one of about 75 employees and affiliated agents of ST Logistics, entrusted in the early days of the outbreak with procuring masks and other essential items like thermometers from all corners of the globe. This included places like Mexico, Denmark, Sri Lanka and South Africa. With the pandemic becoming a gathering storm, such items were suddenly in short supply. Mr. Jayakumar's assignment was to go to a factory in Bengaluru in southwestern India and ensure it was actually there and producing masks. Some less than honest vendors were known to be taking advantage of the global mask buying frenzy. He had to slice open the masks to ensure the filter layer had not been replaced by another material. And also, ensure that the pallets of masks were actually loaded onto trucks and sent to a secure freight agent appointed by ST Logistics. Shipments were known to have been diverted midway or to have mysteriously disappeared into the hands of another country's buyers. Things were starting to turn ugly around the globe. Returning to Singapore after nine days in Bengaluru, he was sent off again the next day, back to Bengaluru and then Mumbai, the financial centre of India on its west coast. But Mr. Jayakuma was prepared to go where he was sent. The race to procure protective face coverings was an exercise in speed as well as wits, and ST Logistics was at the centre of it. In late January 2020, the Ministry of Trade and Industry approached ST Logistics to get masks and other items, such as personal protective equipment, hand sanitizers, and thermometers. ST Logistics Freight Operations Manager, 40-year-old Lian Yongte, said, The people holding the stock of masks were basically behaving like they were sitting on a pile of gold. Uh, they thought, 
I can sell at a higher price to whoever genuinely wants it. On January 31, Mr. Lian was sent with a partner to secure masks from a factory in Jakarta, Indonesia. There, they met a vendor who kept getting calls, supposedly from other interested buyers, in the middle of their discussion. He recounted, They were trying to pressure us to commit. Buy now at this price, or someone else gets the stock. ST Logistics walked away from suppliers who were unfair in their dealings. Prior to the pandemic, disposable surgical masks were a low-value item. As Mr Gabriel Lim, Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Trade and Industry, put it, Well, no one in Singapore bought masks. It was penny to the dollar. Pretty cheap stuff. Singapore companies produce a small number of masks in some overseas factories, but they were generally not intended for domestic use. At home, the government had built up its own reserves of masks for local medical needs, having learned from its experience with the SARS outbreak and transboundary haze. The stockpile of surgical masks was enough only for the medical sector for some months. Then came the pandemic, no one had foreseen a situation in which nearly everybody might need to use a mask on a daily basis. Mr Chan Chun Singh, who was Minister for Trade and Industry till May 2021, said, If everybody used one surgical mask, then it's 5 million per day. Then that is like one whole month of uh, supply for the clinical setting then obviously we can't afford the kind of burn rate whereby you, in one day, use up one month's worth of supply. With surgical masks in short supply, the government decided at first to limit their use to healthcare workers, which was also the advice of the World Health Organization in the early stages of the pandemic. In early January 2020, the Wuhan virus, as it was then known, seemed like a faraway problem. But things started to change as the disease spread outside China. A global run on masks began with Chinese nationals in various countries buying them up in bulk. Then, as COVID-19 began to spread around the world, scarcity descended into chaos. Former supply lines were discontinued and agreements ignored as countries closed their borders and imposed export bans. In early March, Germany stopped the shipment of 240,000 face masks bound for Switzerland, sparking a diplomatic spat. In early April, the United States was accused of modern piracy after allegedly diverting 200,000 masks meant for Germany to its own shores while they were being transferred between planes in Thailand. It was also accused of sending people waving cash to buy a plane load of masks meant for France on the tarmac in China. Singapore was in on the action too. Aside from using ST Logistics, the government tapped its own staff and contacts in overseas networks, sending them to factories and even night markets. Mr Lim said, It was a real wild, wild west back then. There was this massive scrum and, you know, very large countries were reportedly hijacking shipments of masks that had already been paid for and which were bound for other countries. Singapore quietly made plans next to bypass increasingly erratic supply chains and manufacture its own surgical masks. At the centre of this was ST Engineering, which had housed its mask manufacturing line in Taiwan. In late January 2020 though, Taiwan placed an export ban on masks. Not only were all of the company's face masks stuck in the territory, but there were also concerns that the machines used to make the masks would also not be allowed to leave. Taiwan refused to budge, so ST Engineering did the next best thing. It brought the machines home. Given the global retreat towards mask protectionism and the controversial nature of the exercise, the 15-metre-long production lines had to be surreptitiously disassembled and shipped back. The drama behind this exercise remained shrouded in secrecy. A senior civil servant revealed that things had to be done quietly and shipments broken up, 
but declined to go into details. ST Engineering Senior Vice President for Robotics and Autonomous Solutions, Gareth Tang, who flew to Taiwan to oversee the operation, was also tight-lipped. But the 41-year-old did reveal that a crucial ingredient was shipped back to Singapore along with the machines. ST Engineering stock of melt-blown polypropylene, which is essential for making the critical filter layer in a mask. Besides this secret effort, they started buying and importing more surgical mask-making machines. This enabled ST Engineering to begin producing the first batch of made-in-Singapore masks in early February 2020. Mr. Tang, who is also Head of Urban Environment Solutions at SD Engineering, said, It was quite a moment for us. They raced to meet a two-week deadline while restrictions on travel tightened every day. He said, I must say that setting up a plant in 14 days and ensuring every single building block could come in for us to make the final product was very challenging. And when the first piece of surgical mask came off the production line, there was a lot of joy. The next challenge was to produce enough masks to meet the needs of Singapore's entire healthcare system. The melt-blown polypropylene ST Engineering had brought back from Taiwan would soon run out, so the hunt began again to find machines and raw materials to manufacture the country's own supply of filters. With help from MTI and the Economic Development Board, in sourcing what it needed, SD Engineering was able to begin producing filters shortly before Christmas 2020. Mr. Tang said, The key critical elements that allowed us to do so were speed, agility, and expertise. If we were any slower by a week, we'll be finished. As personnel in the field worked to secure a supply of masks, the government was fighting a parallel battle to keep its supply from running out while ensuring people masked up and stayed safe. Mr. Chan said, At that point in time, it was not just a logistic exercise, it was a psychological exercise. The mask itself was not just about preventing inhaling and exhaling of the virus. The mask itself was also a psychological confidence marker. Without the mask, people felt they were not protected. This required a multi-pronged approach. The government had early on released some surgical masks from its stockpiles to retailers. When the panic buying continued, threatening a run on limited supplies, it announced on January 30 that every household would get four surgical masks. The delivery had to be smooth, said Mr Chan. If people had to stand in long lines to collect their masks, it could trigger greater anxiety about shortages. The masks needed to be packed and handed out quickly. And, despite the best efforts of the Singapore Armed Forces, which lent its soldiers for this endeavour, the whole process would take at least two or three days. The decision was made to hand out the masks over seven days through residence committee zones. Mr Chan had grassroots leaders send him photos of the distribution process. Local apparel and textile companies such as Dex and Gimli threw their weight behind their efforts too. When the virus started spreading, they switched some overseas clothing production lines to making reusable masks, to protect their own staff at first, and later, to also show up the nation's supplies when the government approached them for help. Both companies continued to produce masks in 2021. Singapore always willing to learn from the past, is making sure it never has to re-enter the Wild West again. It now has all the materials and capabilities it needs to produce surgical masks for its entire healthcare system, said ST Engineering's Mr. Tang. It can also produce filters for reusable masks. On top of this, it has the capacity to quickly ramp up mask production in the event of an emergency. Mr. Tang is confident that even if a lockdown were to happen tomorrow and imports were to stop completely, the company would be able to continue producing masks substantially. He said, We have learned from our experience. We have established the inventory and the supply chain 
and now the critical material is also made in Singapore. MTI's Mr. Lim said, Now I can tell you, hand on heart, that if the same thing happens again, we can produce our own boxes. It's now February 2022, as I record this podcast episode. I caught up with Mr. Gareth Tang, who is ST Engineering's Senior Vice President for Robotics and Autonomous Solutions. Thanks for joining us, Mr. Tang. What's the current state of the made-in-Singapore mask industry? For instance, can the mask-making machinery itself be made here in the event that a future pandemic cuts our supply lines immediately? Yes, we are now vertically integrated with full manufacturing capabilities from the raw materials to filters and masks to support any immediate needs and future pandemic. Thanks, Mr. Teng. I invited Mr. Gabriel Lim, Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Trade and Industry, to join me in a quick catch-up. So, Mr. Lim, thanks for joining us, and I wanted to ask you, given the threat of the next big variant and new diseases, What's Singapore's current progress in building self-resilience in the production of essential items, like masks? Uh, well, thanks very much, Tim. Very happy to join you today. I, I would just say that uh, we definitely have made progress. Um, but I would say that it is the progress is done on multiple fronts. I think for you asked specifically about our local production capacity, I will share with you that we certainly are able to produce a fair amount of masks for domestic consumption. And we can ramp up if necessary, if demand were to rise. But uh, I should also add that uh, domestic production is not the only way in which we are hoping to manage or fulfill the demand for such essential medical supplies. Uh, we have also been diversifying our imports from uh, many other countries so that we are not overly affected by any disruption in any single one import source. And also stockpiling, just to make sure that we can weather any short-term supply chain disruptions and to make sure that our essential needs are taken care of, at least temporarily. So, what proportion of our mass supply is made in Singapore, and what proportion out of Singapore? No, I think it's uh, I think it's a function also of uh, how well the market is working. So long as uh, so supplies keep flowing, the markets remain open, export bans are not in place, I think uh, we would uh, do far better diversifying our imports and making sure that we are able to meet local demand for masks and other essential medical items in a, in a way that's uh, obviously affordable and a way that's uh, reliable. Um, but obviously, when uh, supply chains are constricted, when there is, hopefully not, but should there be export bans in place, then naturally the proportion produced or the proportion supplied by local production will rise. And this is a dynamic uh, balance that will vary and will be optimized depending on the external situation. Okay. And will there ever be a case where we rely 100% on domestic supply? Well, I hope that, uh, I mean, a, a time where we will produce everything ourselves may well be a time when there are global export bans and we have no choice but to be self-sufficient. And under, frankly speaking, I hope that that scenario never comes to pass. I hope that markets will remain open. I hope that countries will still continue to trade with one another, be it masks, be it food, be it energy supplies, and so that we can continue to enjoy this mix uh, of both imports as well as some local production in order to fulfill our national needs. Thanks, Mr. Lin. We hope you enjoyed listening to this. I'm Timothy Goh of The Straits Times. In the next episode out on April 18, my colleague Sumiko Tan will chronicle the attempt to manage an unprecedented national crisis, titled Inside Singapore's COVID-19 War Room. You've been listening to Singapore's War on COVID, a podcast series by The Straits Times. This podcast series is based on selected chapters from a book detailing Singapore's experience battling the COVID-19 pandemic. The book, written by journalists of The Straits Times and edited by ST's executive editor Sumiko Tan, is titled In This Together, Singapore's COVID-19 Story and is available in major bookstores now. Details online at stbooks.sg That was a podcast by The Straits Times.
Send your feedback to podcast at sph.com.sg. Find us on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or via the Google Voice Assistant and Amazon Alexa-enabled devices. For more podcasts by The Straits Times, The Business Times, and Money FM 89.3, you can also download the audio by SPH app. That's A-W-E-D-I-O.